G'day, how are you going? It is so good to see you. Today we're going to talk about the Z5. Now I've had it for a few weeks and I've taken shots like this one right here with the Z5. So I can tell you, it's a great little camera. Now this video is going to be sprinkled with lots and lots of images from the Z5 with all sorts of ridiculous Nikon Z lenses, like the 70 to 200 2.8S, as well as the legendary, awe-inspiring 50 millimeter 1.2S. What a joy sticking that lens on the front of the Z5. I look forward to showing you those images and so much more. All right, let's do this. So where does the Z5 fit in? Now, I'm not really a let's, let's push through all the specs sort of guy, but there are some really important things about the Z5 which need to be signposted. Nikon have gone through an interesting birthing process with the Z series of cameras. And of course the Z6 and the Z7 in some quarters created a lot of controversy for things as simple as not having a vertical grip with buttons and not having two card slots. So what was really interesting about the Z5, which was announced something like about six months ago, give or take, was I think one of the most important features for many was the fact that it had two two card slots and there they are right there two sd card slots so what's really interesting about this camera is that it's possible for a professional who is worried about redundancy to use this camera yet it fits in a very affordable price point here in australia i'm seeing it now sub two thousand dollars nineteen hundred dollars give or take uh, depending on who you buy it from and whether it's on sale and I'm seeing it in the USA sub $1,200, again, depending on who you buy it from and if it's on sale. So this is a very affordable, full frame, 24 megapixel, dual card slot, stills camera. Now it has video camera capabilities, it has 4K, although it is with a crop. Uh, and of course it has 1080p, it doesn't do 120 FPS, it only does 60 FPS. But I suppose you can't in the Z5, which as I've said is very affordable, in the Z5 you can't put everything that's in the Z6. Now, when the Z5 first came out, one of the most difficult things when looking at it was, was that we knew the Z6 II was coming, it was just around the corner. So when I initially started talking about the Z5, it was kind of the Z5, you know, versus the Z6. But now really in my mind, Nikon's plan is clearer and it is the Z5 versus the Z6 II. And it makes it a little bit simpler to separate them. And some core differences are the fact that the Z6 II, uh, any moment now in the next few weeks, will be able to do 4K 60. And yes, it is with a crop, but it is 60. That's something that's pretty cool. Yes, it has two card slots, but one of them is the CFX Express slash XQD style card slot, which from my perspective is very robust. I haven't had any failures so far, and I first started using them in the Nikon D4 in 2012. So that's absolutely fantastic. Used them a lot with the D850s since 2017 and have used them non-stop and only used them with the Z6, the Z7 and the Z6 II. So I've got a lot of frames. I'm using these cameras pretty much every day. I've had no failures. The Z6 II has a CFX XQD slot and an SD slot, whereas the Z5 only has two SD slots. Really, from my perspective, I'm not really sure why that difference is there, because someone moving from a Z5 who might want to move up to a Z6 II, they could have had the two separate slots. I suspect it's cheaper. It's a bit smaller, the SD slots. 
maybe it fits in better. If you think about the market that they're aiming the camera at, which is the um, entry level full frame market, that market probably doesn't want to spend as much money and we all have quite a few SD cards. So look, it does make sense. So this is fantastic. You've got a super affordable entry level full frame 24 megapixel camera which has Nikon's latest focusing system, which from my perspective covers all your bases unless you're photographing people moving quickly, maybe at night. And even then, I haven't tested that. I'm only going on what the internet tries to tell me and I, it's not part of my use case. For my use case, I don't have any problems with any of the Z cameras, especially with their latest firmware updates, getting what I need to get and you can see on this channel what I get. But really what I'm trying to say is here that the Z5 has a completely usable and completely workable uh, focusing system, whether you shoot like I do, which the majority of the things I photograph are static, although not all of them. And I was enjoying using the 50 millimeter 1.2. This is my daughter. She's still learning how to catch. She's only five years old, and this is what we call a screamer. And she's coming towards the camera reasonably quickly. And uh, we can see here, this is on the Z5 with the Z50mm 1.2 at a very razor thin depth of field of 2.2. And that's completely sharp where it needs to be. So we can see that the Z5 is gonna work for 90% of people's focusing face tracking applications if you need and want to do that sort of thing. Here it is, working. And that was the hit ratio I got, something around 80 to 90% in this situation with people running towards the camera. All I'm trying to say is here is the Z focusing system I think is fantastic and it's going to work for 95 to 99% of people's use cases. But besides that, the other major difference where this camera might be seen as being different from the Z6 II or the Z6 is the sensor. Now it is not a BSI sensor. Here is some examples of the Z5 at night at higher ISOs. I know absolutely nothing about photographing starscapes. I was in the country 100 kilometers from the nearest major city but about 10 kilometers from a smaller village, a smaller town which means that it wasn't full darkness. But I decided to point the Z5, as we can see here, at the moon. This is the moon with the Z50 f1.2. I am hand-holding hand holding this at one third of a second at f1.3 50 mil. And this is the sort of results that you can expect. So if we go into... 100%. I'm not doing anything special here. This is pretty much straight out of camera. As I said, I don't know anything about photographing stars, so I don't know if this movement we can see in the stars is camera shake or whether it's the rotation of the Earth. You might be able to work it out because they're all going the same way. It may well be as simple as the rotation of the Earth. Please, somebody let me know. So many of you are so good at stars. I want to do stars soon. This is the Z5. I think that's a pretty good looking f file and we can see lots of stars. There they are. It, we can do even better, of course. Really wanted to show you this image because this is complete darkness. This gives you an actual idea of what it was looking like. The sun has completely gone down. We're 10.30 at night, I think it was. Where's the time? Here it is. Almost 10.30 at night. It's absolutely dark. But this is 800 ISO at one third of a second, again at f1.3, just because I must have knocked it. And that is capturing so much light and still looking fantastic. And I'm doing this handheld. It was very windy, so you've got the trees moving here. But I think this, this stuff's looking pretty, pretty solid. That's 200%. Let's go back out to 100%. Remember, 
We've got no light except for the moon. That's it. The moon. I think this is pretty impressive. I'll just show you one more. Where are you hiding? This one here. This is about half an hour or so after the sunset. A, bit, a little bit longer. More like 45 minutes after the sunset. But again, ISO 400. A thirteenth of a second at 1.2. Obviously, we've got a pretty stellar lens there in the 50 mil, and you can just see how sharp that's looking at 200%. We can see a little bit of blur because the windmill is turning. But this is the Z5. This is the Z5. Just to reiterate, this is the Z5 looking absolutely fantastic. Anyway, I, I have found the outcome to be similar. This, this camera gives you totally the outcome that you need. Now... Perhaps as you push it higher and higher, above 64 ISO, it starts to show the fact that it's not quite as good as a BSI sensor. Again, there needs to be some differentiation between the Z5 and the Z6 II. I think for the majority of people who are looking to buy this camera, you're either entry level or enthusiast, or this is a second camera anyway. It's a backup camera or it's a second camera. Let's say you're a wedding photographer and you're needing, you, you, like me, you shoot with two or three bodies and you're going to attach a specific lens that works best with the body. That's how I've always done it. So for example, if I think a camera is, one camera is slightly better in low light than the other, then I will put the lens that can give me a bit more light on the camera that's not quite so good. And that's how I solve those sorts of problems. I really don't see any downsides to this camera if you're a stills photographer and you're an enthusiast, you're entry level, or this is going to be a B camera. But the reality is, even as an A camera, I was talking to someone on the phone the other day about the fact that when the D3 came out, 12 megapixels, blew my mind, thought it was the best thing ever. And it was, and it still is. It's still a spectacular camera, as is the D4 and the D5 and so on. The sensor in this camera, in the Z5, will be better than the D3 or the D4 sensor and will give you amazing results. So I do think we should be careful not to sell this technology short. It's still going to deliver. It's going to deliver focus. It's going to deliver high ISO. It's going to deliver dynamic range. And the differences between the two are minimal. Now, you can look at the charts. And you can see there is a slight difference. But it's slight. Again, we're talking in that 95 and 100% such a little difference. Now, of course, if you want the best that money can buy, and uh, if, you, if, you, if we talk about what DP Review said about the Z7 II and its immense dynamic range, then sure, then you should spend the most money if you want the bleeding edge. But like everything in life, you can pay, you can pay 40% less but get 95% of the result. So you, you, you've got to decide your use case, you've got to decide your legacy, and you've got to decide your budget. And that's where the Z5 fits in. And if we look at, um, say, the, uh, the Sony a7C, it, it's a bit of a different camera in the sense that it's kind of, it's got a smaller body. It's harder to hang on to from the body perspective. It's got a much smaller eyepiece, yet it's a slightly more expensive camera. So I don't really see those two comparing apples with apples. They are a similar uh, they are a similar megapixel count. They're both full frame and they're both the entry level full frame for each manufacturer. But I would say if you want the more traditional photographer's experience, the Z5 would be the way to go. And I suppose if you're looking for the more vlogger experience, and that can be pretty quickly seen by the fact that the A7C spins the screen towards you so you can see yourself. And that pretty much differentiates those two cameras just like that.
segueing from the A7C and how it's a little bit harder to hold onto and the, the viewfinder is not quite so good, this is something that the, all of the Z cameras excel at. The, from my perspective, they're top notch and on par and class leading. Like they're, they're up there with the class leading cameras and that is ergonomics. Ergonomics button placement. And it's not just button placement and ergonomics, but it's the logic of how it all works. Nikon have that number one. And the beauty about the Z5 is there's nothing skimped in regards to buttons and so on. It's all there. You get exactly the same as what you get in the Z6, the Z62, the Z7, and the Z72. And the only difference is, is that they've moved this from here to here and removed the screen. But honestly, the removal of the screen, I, I do use it, but it's not a deal breaker, not even close. And moving this from here to here make, makes no difference. So, but the, the size of the grip and all of these buttons and everything else is absolutely identical. Absolutely identical. So you get the same ergonomic experience across all of the Z primes, five, six, seven, and their variants. You get the same ergonomic experience. And I just think it's fantastic that, that Nikon uh, giving such an entry level camera such a higher level, higher mid level experience, you get the same ergonomics. Fantastic, same button layout, except for that one button. There's some other minor, minor differences, like they haven't put the, the kind of faux leather rubber stuff here, which makes zero difference to me. And there might be some slight difference in the composites that are being used. But you know, I, I can't analyze this stuff. But as we've talked about in this video here, these composites are probably bulletproof regardless of which one it is. Makes sense. Again, this camera is cheaper. Um, the Z62's RRP here is around three and a half thousand. And I have, as I said, I've seen the Z5 for sub two. So it's significantly different. It's not quite half, but it's getting close to half the price. That's when it's on sale. When they're both on sale, it's probably about three grand versus two grand. So depending on which way you look at it, the Z62 is 50% more expensive than the Z5. And that's significant. And, but what I would say is, the, the output, don't worry exactly about how the, the composites feel, but the output is very similar, yet you're paying, uh, you're paying 50% more for the Z6 II. Now, if you, if you don't shoot video, I don't think it's a big deal. And if you don't need frame rates, because this is another thing, if you don't need frame rates above five frames per second, then it's not a big deal. I did it once to try and get an exploding piece of concrete, which we were filming for a TV ad and they were shooting it on a high speed ARRI anyway, or a RED, one or the other. And just, just stick with the camera that can do, I think it was doing 120 frames per second uh, on the ARRI as opposed to on the D4. I mean, if you wanna do that, then you may as well just shoot 4K 120 FPS and then frame grab with RED RAW and not even worry about doing it with a stills camera. That, that's today. This shoot that I was on was a few years ago. Of course, it comes with the, with the new E-N-E-L, uh, is that what it is? E-N-E-L e -E 15C. There it is there in Stealth Bomber Black, which is fantastic. Um, it, it is a longer life battery. It's got, I think it's something like three, it's 1700 to 2200 or 2100, so 400 milliwatts of extra power. So it's uh, 15, 20% more capacity. And you can buy those batteries and put them in your older cameras and they will, they will get a longer life. And that, what's great about that battery and the Z5 is you can charge it while it's on, not while it's just off. I have found with my Z6 and Z7, I can get the majority of a day shooting from one battery. So I can get say five or six hours into the day and only then do I need to change a battery. Uh, and that's with the older battery, that's with the B variant. So two batteries is all you need to get through a day with these cameras. And then of course, if you do charge them while you're sitting down for lunch, 
you could probably potentially get away with one battery. This little guy here, it has to go back to Nikon now. Uh, thank you to Nikon Professional Services very, very much. Uh, if you're moving from an entry level enthusiast, Nikon DSLR, I think, I think this is a great place to start. If you're wondering about full frame uh, and you've been in crop sensor, I think this is a great place to start. And of course, from here, you can move into any other part of the Nikon Z ecosystem. You might decide you want to go back to crop sensor and so there's the Z50. I do think we will see another crop sensor Z camera from Nikon this year. I think that's probably likely. They've just announced the fact that uh, two of the previous DSLR crop sensor cameras are now officially discontinued. The 3500 and the 5600 they are officially discontinued. So you'd have to think that Nikon are gonna follow up and have two, at least two, in the crop sensor DX line. So I think we will probably see, my guess is, and the rumor is that it's a Z30, an even cheaper version of the, uh, the Z, the full-size Z, Z mount cameras in cropped mode. That's pretty exciting. Z5 sits right in the middle of the range at this point in time from my perspective. I'm confident we'll see a Z30 or something like that sometime this year. But if you wanna go full frame, it's fantastic. Then you can take full advantage of the wonderful, affordable entry-level primes from Nikon, all the 1.8s, which of course, as you would know, I swear by. But the Z5 will, you, will allow you to access all of those and use them full frame. And of course, all the other other lenses. And as I said, I used the 50mm 1.2 on the Z5. It worked like a charm, and it's lovely to think that you can have this crazy 50mm 1.2, which is uh, almost twice the price of the camera itself, but delivering outstanding results. From my perspective, a fantastic, affordable, entry-level, full-frame camera. If you're a photographer, it's not gonna let you down. If it's a videographer, it will work. It'll work great in situations like this. If you wanna do 1080p, you'll get full-frame. And if you wanna do 4K, it's cropped a little bit, but that's okay. You just use the right lens. For example, I'm using a 50mm lens uncropped. You'd just put a 35mm lens and you would get exactly the same. Well, you would get a very similar result to what we're getting right now. It's that easy or that hard. Is your glass half full or is it half empty? That's all you gotta do. Very quickly, I just wanna show you clips that have been shot with the Z5. Uh, this, this is me, this is ungraded straight out of camera. And this is a 4K clip with the crop. So it just, it gives you an idea. What, I, what I'm trying to show you here is it gives you an idea that this camera's completely usable. This was me photographing rain at night. I love it. I think it looks beautiful. There's a dragonfly. This is with the 50 mil. Very, very, very difficult to get something like this in focus. But there you go. You can see in focus, this is just raw footage, which I haven't graded. I haven't done anything with at all. Be on a flower. So again, this is the 4K out of the Z5. Nighttime, 4K out of the Z5. And this is on the 70 to 200 with the crop, so it was more heading towards uh, 300 mil. Is that right? I think it is close to 300 mil. So again, this is just daylight on a tripod looking great. So again, this just gives you an idea that the Z5 is a perfectly workable 4K video camera. You just have to take into account the crop. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'd, I'd love to hear any questions that you have regarding the Z5. It's a great little camera. And please let me know your thoughts. Is the Z5 something you're gonna get? Are you interested in going into 
perhaps your first full frame mirrorless camera or are you coming from say a D750 that's a, a reasonable step across to the Z5 or you may be entertaining the Z6 II which is a very powerful all-rounder camera which has a lot going for it but as I said it's 50% more expensive give or take and if this is your first time here please subscribe please share please like and I look forward to seeing you so soon. And if you'd like to see some more episodes, there's over 280 right down there that you can watch right now. All right. I've just had such a great time with this lens. And uh, there's just so much. There's just so much to talk about and to do at the moment. Uh, my kids' holidays, their school holidays will be over in two weeks and then you'll get all of me back and I can get cracking with all of the so many different things that I'm really looking forward to showing you. Only two weeks to go. We will get there. All right. I will see you very soon. Bye for now.